Welcome to Feel Good From Within. I'm Yvette Lee Blowitz, your host. Today's guest is Dr. Camilla Nord, who is an award-winning neuroscientist and the author of The Balanced Brain. In this podcast episode, Dr. Camilla Nord shares how there are many routes to mental well-being and why it's different for all of us. I'm super grateful that you are choosing to listen into this podcast episode, and I hope this conversation allows you to learn, develop, and grow. Dr. Camilla Nord, welcome to the podcast show. How are you today? It is so great to be here, Yvette. I want to welcome our global audience. I'm super grateful you are here and tuning into this podcast show, and I really hope this helps you to learn, develop, and grow. Camilla, before we dive into your book, are you happy to tell our audience a little bit about yourself? I'm a neuroscientist, so in my day job, I run a lab, and my lab is really interested in the causes of mental health conditions. And so to, to understand that better, we do different kinds of experiments. So some of my experiments, we use MRI scanning to look at the activity in the brain under different conditions. So for example, if somebody is experiencing sad emotions or happy emotions or learning what to pursue or avoid in the world, so functions that we think are relevant to mental health. And sometimes I use other kinds of approaches like brain stimulation where you can use electrical or magnetic stimulation to change activity in specific regions of the brain. So using all these kind of fancy pants technological innovations, we're hoping to move us towards, you know, perhaps a more biological understanding of where mental health comes from. Mental health is a very personal, subjective phenomenon, but it's driven by our biology. And I think by experiments like these, we can move closer to a sort of personalized medicine framework where treatments could be targeted for an individual's brain biology rather than their description of their symptoms, which is what we do at the moment. And when it comes to your book, The Balanced Brain, what inspired you to write your book? And what is the meaning behind the book title? It was a tricky decision to title it The Balanced Brain because in some senses, I think all brains are balanced. And I don't want my title to be interpreted as sort of, oh, if only I had a balanced brain, I would be mentally healthy. Actually, the message that my book conveys is that every brain has the properties necessary for resilience. And at any given point, even if you are experiencing a mental illness, your brain is pursuing these same balanced properties, kind of like homeostasis in the body. Your body finds balance. Just like that, your brain learns what to expect and kind of predicts it in order to have a more homeostatic process ongoing. So I think this is an important function of the brain, of everyone's brain, and it's really key to mental health. In your book, you talked about natural opioids, which was laughter. Can you share with our audience what are the mental health benefits of laughter and why you included that in your book? Well, I was really keen to open the book with a chapter about pleasure and pain. I think pleasure is one of the first things we think about when we think about our own mental health. And pain is a huge source of mental ill health for many, many people. So I was hoping that by delving into the biology of pleasure, I could show just how biological, really subjective experiences like laughter are. So in one really cool experiment, I didn't do, so I'm impartial, they took a bunch of friends and they showed them comedy videos. And when you laugh at comedy videos, this evokes a opioid response in your brain, kind of like taking an opioid drug. So it's a chemical response in your brain that's dependent on social laughter. And the really cool thing about it is that what you might know about opioid drugs is that they're painkillers. And so is social laughter. 
So in the experiment, they also had people do something mildly painful. They had to do wall sits. If you're at the gym much, you know how annoying that is. And people were able to do it for longer if they had experienced this social laughter. And that was related to the amount of opioid release in their brain, which they measured with a brain scanner. So it shows that even something kind of so social, so human has this really cool biological underpinning. I love that in your book. And thank you for explaining that because I think based on what is going on in the world at the moment and over the last year, one of the things we haven't done enough is laugh. So I thought that was a really good action we could all take in our own life, either with friends, family, or finding a good comedy or something to laugh at. There was a study about couples and laughter that I kind of finished that section with, where couples, when they're arguing, if they laugh during the arguments, that sort of predicted the happiness of the couple in their relationship. And I do think about that a lot, that even when you're kind of really pissed off with your partner, if you can find the funny aspect, that's quite good for your relationship. I did love that part because you mentioned couples that have laughter in their relationship and laugh or make time to laugh are more susceptible for healthier relationships. That's what it looked like. You know, it's not a causal study, it's a (laughs) correlation. (laughs) I love that. When you talked about opioids, I'm hearing this more and more through podcasts about, unfortunately, people getting so addicted to these opioids. Are you seeing that as well in your research and in your neuroscience field that you're in? So the kind of opioid crisis, and I think it it really is a crisis, is a kind of devastating thing that's happened. I don't blame anyone who's become addicted to opioids. It could happen to any of us because they capitalize on these same brain circuits that are so essential for our survival, essential for our pleasure, essential for relief of pain. So it's kind of predictable that we invent these drugs and people can become dependent on them. I think there are many sources of blame, but another thing to sort of mention is that for some people, Opioids are a source of pain relief and are not an addiction. So I think there are kind of two aspects to this story. There are people who have opioid dependence and it's really destructive to them. And then there are also people who kind of healthily use opioids. They've been prescribed them for their chronic pain, for example. And for those people, they're a life source. So I think we have to be very careful to sort of be super aware of the dangers of opioids, but also aware of the fact that they are a really important resource in medicine if used correctly. And obviously, if someone is in the crisis, if they can go and see a mental health medical professional to seek that support they need, because I know that we all have an addictive nature to some aspects, don't we? Whether that's coffee, chocolate, why are we inclined to want to have these things that give us that pick-me-up? I think it's really the way we were made. We have evolved to pursue things that give us pleasure, but that also give us calories, but that also give us satisfaction and a very human thing. But, you know, these various kind of sources of positive reinforcement. And we have entire brain systems devoted to learning what these things are, motivating us to pursue them, working really hard, doing difficult tasks in order to get them. So do rats, so do monkeys. It's a kind of common mechanism across species. But I think we really are built to learn what in the world gives us rewards and how to get it. Well, you've just made us all feel so much better. So if we crave chocolate and we do it repeatedly, we're wired for seeking pleasure. Yeah, I think we are. And people sort of respond to this in different ways. I think one interesting aspect of some of this sort of like behavioral addictions, food addictions, articles and and podcasts and so on that have been coming out over the last decade is that people sort of tar everything like with the same brush and they're like okay you know I guess I shouldn't eat any chocolate and I guess I shouldn't eat anything unhealthy and everything is an addiction and even things I like like exercise exercise can be an addiction and of course everything can have a negative element 
But I think we should be quite careful with what we call an addiction, because if you're using something so much that you're not going to your job, taking care of your child, you know, that's an addiction. But the rest of the time, it might just be something that you find quite pleasurable that brings you enjoyment in your life. And so for me personally, I don't think that the source of mental health really comes from self-deprivation. I love that. Such a positive message. So we shouldn't feel bad if we have that nice piece of chocolate from time to time and have that little bit of a pleasure. Going to one of the big key messages I took away from your book was you said, I think drive is important for feeling well. Drive is an essential ingredient to our mental health. Why is drive so important to our mental health? So in my book, I talk about some essential ingredients of mental health. And I would say all but drive are obvious, are intuitive. So one of them is pleasure. One of them is the sense of your own body. One of them, perhaps less intuitive, but if you think about it, it makes sense, is our ability to learn about the world, learn what's good, learn what's bad. And then the final one that I think is so crucial, but that often gets neglected, is drive or motivation. And the reason I think it's so crucial is because you can't have any of the other stuff without drive. You can't have pleasure without drive. You can't learn what to pursue, what to avoid without that initial motivation, that initial drive. And in fact, many really of the most debilitating mental health symptoms come from a change in drive, a change in motivation. So for example, in depression and related disorders, people experience anhedonia, which is a lack of anticipation or drive of pleasurable things in the world. So you no longer feel motivated to do something that might be rewarding. You feel that the effort isn't worth the reward, which is a really really impairing thing to feel. And it actually has a weird commonality with a neurological symptom that can happen in Parkinson's and other neurological disorders called apathy, which I also talk about in the book. And apathy is not exactly the same as anhedonia, but similarly involves this total absence of motivation. And I think this is really key because it shows us that there is a common symptom, a common syndrome maybe, across different types of brain disorders, things we think of as really different, that is taking away that real sort of essence, that core fundamental aspect of your mental health, which is your motivation to get anything you want. One of the symptoms you mentioned, if someone's depressed, they might not feel as motivated or have the energy to do something So when that happens, you also talked in your book about things that can help. It's not all about the chemical imbalance when it comes to depression. And then basically not one size fits all when it comes to medication or even treatment. So what is happening in the brain when someone is feeling depressed? So one of the arguments I make in my book is that it's no one thing. In the same way that each of us have these various roots to mental health, these various processes that support our mental health, including pleasure and motivation and learning. In the same way, someone with depression doesn't just have one common change that is the case with every other person with depression. Actually, There are kind of common changes that map onto some people, but not everyone with depression. And so that means that when you see changes in the brain, in places like the bits that involve reward, the bits that involve emotion, these are not something that occur in every single patient with depression. And that's actually key for understanding why antidepressants don't work on everyone, because they're only fixing what's wrong in some people. So they're only addressing an underlying issue that is the case in a subset of people with depression. In your research, have you found that sometimes people's own personal life, whether they're in a job they hate, maybe going through a divorce, there are things that they're not happy with, that this can actually trigger depression or trigger mental illness or something within the brain or within themselves 
And one of the important components to mental health is also working not only on the circuitry or the chemicals within the brain, but also overall life style. Yeah, absolutely. So I think a big misconception is that there are kind of social influences on your mental health, and then there maybe are biological influences. And for me, that's a false dichotomy. There's a false categories because social influences and genetic influences both affect your brain. So I'll give you an example of myself. When I was in the late stages of lockdown in the UK, it was really, really tough for me. We all had these kind of massive restrictions. So did you on what we were allowed to do. I wasn't able to see any of my friends. I hadn't seen my family in a very, very long time. And so I started to feel really, really low. So that is a completely social origin. But what it was doing was it was affecting my brain. That's why I was feeling low, was because of changes in my brain that happened because of these social changes. So I think depression and other mental health disorders are all a combination of biological and social origins, but even things where you can pinpoint a specific social origin, loss of a job, loss of a partner, what they're doing is they're interacting with your biology. And that's why even really kind of tremendously horrific things that people go through, not every single person develops, say, post-traumatic stress disorder after a trauma because it interacts with your biology. And for some people, that can become a disorder. And for some people, we don't know why, they're resilient. Thank you for sharing your own personal story. And I definitely can resonate with that. And I'm sure a lot of our listeners tuning in would be able to as well, because it was something we had never experienced before being locked down and in confinement away from all the pleasures and the things we once did. There are a lot of people still struggling to get their health back to what it was before COVID. A lot of people have had some mental illness triggered by the lockdowns. What are some of the things that people who are listening in who really want to get better mental health could try. You share a lot of things in your book through psychological therapy, exercise, through all of your neuroscience and research on your book. What are a couple of tips we could try? In my book, one of the messages is that different things work for different people, which we probably all have an intuition for, but it really goes into depth about why certain things might work. So why exercise might work for some people, but not others for their mental health. Why psychological therapy might work for some people, but not others. Why some interventions might cause even side effects in some people, but be a miracle treatment in others. So everything from kind of psychedelics to mainstream antidepressants to cognitive behavioral therapy, all of this sort of maps on to our individual patterns of mental health and helps or not, depending on that particular pattern. What I take from that and what I would kind of, the sort of the advice I would give from that is that if one thing hasn't worked for you, try another. Because chances are the fact that one particular treatment hasn't worked for you is just a reflection of your own mental health pattern, not necessarily matching up to what that treatment's doing. Now, in the future, as a scientist, what I'd love to do is match that better. But for now, I think what you can do is try something else. I love that advice. So keep trying. What's your thoughts on meditation for people who haven't tried meditation? So one thing I talk about in my book is that I'm a really bad meditator. <laughs> I'm just bad. I'm really like, it does not come naturally to me. I've been trying for like well over a decade, most days. <laughs> I like, I try. I sometimes have found like specific things that can help me, I think, get closer to what other people describe when they're meditating. So if I am really tired because I've just exercised, I'm better at it. For some people, that's the exact opposite. So I think it's not necessarily about being good at any of these things that can improve your mental health and feeling like, oh, great, you know, I just was amazing at that particular bit of exercise or meditation comes very naturally to me, but actually finding something that even if it's tricky for you, even if it's difficult, 
does have a positive effect on your mental health. So whilst I can't just kind of sit down and meditate and it affects my mental health, I know this kind of route into it where if I exercise first, if I'm in the right environment, especially away from home, actually, then I'm able to. And that has a really positive effect on my mental health. There are people for whom that same exact thing might be really unhelpful for them. So there's a minority of people who find mindfulness interventions actually quite upsetting. So it can kind of bring up trauma that they've experienced. I think it's good not to sort of say even something that seems harmless like meditation or mindfulness might be actively unhelpful for some people. And if that's you, don't judge yourself for it. There's no need. There's many, many other routes. One thing that maybe is a little bit surprising that I will mention is that I have a real scientifically and also personally, I have a real interest in the overlap between physical and mental health. And this is maybe a little bit surprising to some people when we talk about it, they sort of think of their physical health as one domain that is treated by antibiotics or other kinds of physical treatments. And then their mental health is a separate domain that maybe is affected by social things in the world around them. But actually, I like to think there's a real crossover there. Sometimes physical symptoms are treated really well with something like cognitive behavioral therapy, really surprisingly well, depending on the physical symptom. And then sometimes mental health symptoms can be addressed by physical intervention. So for a subset of people, interventions that decrease inflammation, so they work via the immune system, are helpful for their mental health. Talking about inflammation, you talk about that in the book, how it heightens depression and symptoms. Yeah, both, yeah. One of the things I found fascinating was that we can get a flu vaccine and that can heighten the inflammation. So for people who may be living with depression, that can maybe trigger some depression symptoms. It could do. So I'm actually someone who really responds to inflammation triggers. If you have an injection that really raises your inflammation, if you have an infection or a virus that really raises your inflammation, a subset of people, including me, have real mood symptoms. And the reason for that, what we know from experiments, is that you can give people, say, a typhoid injection, something else that causes an inflammatory response in the body, and then there are brain changes in the same circuits that we see change in depression, these same kind of emotion and reward processing circuits in the brain. That to me shows that there is a kind of causal relationship between heightened inflammation and depression via the brain. But this isn't true in everyone. I think many people might be hearing this and say, well, I never feel low or down, you know, beyond perhaps mm. annoyance about having a cold or something. And, and that's because actually for some people, this is not a route that affects them. And that may have to do with their immune system. It may have to do with how their brain interprets their immune system. It might be a little bit of a mix of both. When it comes to good foods to eat. What are just a couple of foods that you like to eat as a neuroscientist for good brain health? I think there really isn't a kind of definitive connection between diet and mental health, except for dietary deficiencies. So let's say you have like a B12 vitamin deficiency, you might have a real effect on your mental health and actually also your physical health. It can even cause kind of neurological damage if you have a profound B12 vitamin deficiency. B12 is from animal products like eggs and milk and meat. So that's like the most important mental health message about food is not to have a vitamin deficiency if you can help it and to sort of be aware of that. But I think there are more modest correlations with other types of dietary patterns, and we don't yet know why. So one aspect of that is things like the Mediterranean diet that you might have heard of that seems correlated with our mental health. But we don't really know why, what aspect of that, whether it really is causing it or is there kind of additional factors that make someone choose to eat like that, but also be more mentally healthy. Similarly, with the microbiome, there's, I think, really convincing animal evidence for improving an animal's microbiome, improving the diversity of the microbiome and improving that animal's mental health-like behavior, so making them less anxious often. In humans, I think the evidence is less strong, and I'd like it to be, but it's just not there yet. So we just haven't really seen those kind of big definitive 
trials. Instead, like with the Mediterranean diet, there's a correlation between aspects of the microbiome and better mental health. And that would be eating things like sauerkraut and pickles and kimchi. In my opinion, jury is still out on the diet, kind of keep aware of the microbiome literature. It may be that we have a sort of breakthrough in the next few years. It may be that if you're not a fan of pickled stuff, who knows who will be right in this <laughs> in the longer term. <laughs> we'll keep drinking our kombuchas. Yeah, luckily I love kombucha, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> When it comes to your self-care rituals, what are some of your self-care rituals that you like to practice? So one that I do that I talk about a little bit in the book and the reason for my kind of many years of failed meditation attempts is because I do actually practice yoga like most days every day and I have done since I was about 20, 21. But what I really like is the sort of physical aspect of yoga, which is really only kind of one part of it. I like learning new yoga poses. I like kind of challenging myself. I love that. That's sort of my biggest self-care thing that I do almost every day. And then the other thing that I do that we've already touched on a little bit is that I like to be less restrictive than some people about things like treats and diet and things like that. And I think part of that is personal. I think as a woman, we're constantly assaulted by diet culture and this kind of idea that, you know, basically everything fun is bad for you and we should be guilty about anything that we might enjoy. And so I sort of personally dislike that. And so I try to let myself have a treat once a day or whatever. I think that a lot of stress has arisen because of this idea that kind of it's all or nothing. You are either some kind of horrible person who only eats donuts all day, every day, or you're like a pure, you know, only drinking kale juice from <laughs> 5 a.m. onwards. I think I don't want to pick a side of that. I love that message because it allows you to experience life as it is and to enjoy it. And you're not putting yourself under constant pressure and stress based on what food you want to eat. With your book, what was the most fascinating research that you discovered as part of writing your book? While I was writing the book, I was also just finishing up an experiment. It was quite a fun experiment, like both in terms of what we found, but also even just in running it. Because the idea for it came when I was just having a chat at work one day with one of my good friends. We were having a chat over coffee. He told me about a recent thing he'd found in his experiment. So he's really interested in disgust. And he discovered that unlike fear, disgust is really, really, really hard to shake. You don't habituate to it, no matter how many disgusting things you show someone, they still feel disgusted. He's an expert in eye tracking, where you analyze pupils. Crucially, people's pupils still avoid looking at anything disgusting, even after they've seen it for ages, which is just not the case with fear. We kind of normalize to it and we become curious. Not so with disgust. And I said to him, gosh, I wonder if some of that has to do with the body the body's response to disgust. Maybe, you know, our stomach is sending this signal that doesn't habituate and that is kind of causing us to avoid. And so we sort of chatted about this and the only work that had been done before, which is there's a kind of limited literature on this, had sort of found correlations between how much your stomach was contracting and people's experience of disgust, but no sort of causal link. So I found this drug that is an anti-nausea drug and it changes the contractions of the stomach. And we gave it to people while they were doing my friend's task where they look at disgusting images. And we discovered that people were less avoidant of the images when they were on this anti-nausea drug that affected their stomach, showing that disgust is partially influenced by the stomach. That was a finding that we discovered while I was writing my book. And I was like, wow, this is so interesting. I wrote about it in one of the chapters. I listened to that story in your book via your Audible book. And that was interesting because I had never thought of disgust, but at the moment when I look on social media, there is a lot of disgust. And, and I must admit, I have to look away. 
Yeah, me too. I think it's a neglected emotion for mental health as well, but actually really important. I'm working with a a researcher at the moment where we've been discussing the role of disgust in eating disorders. We think it could play a particular role, self-disgust, feelings of disgust about food, which kind of magnifies and makes people feel, you know, really extreme food avoidance in some eating disorders. That's fascinating. Before we say goodbye, what is your hope for your newfound book readers, audio listeners? I think the two main things I hope people take away from this book are first, that the physical and biological world is the same world as your kind of emotional, social sphere. And this is a sort of philosophical point, but it's also a really personal and pragmatic point, because it means sometimes when you're feeling unwell emotionally, you might need to look to your physical body. And when you're feeling unwell physically, sometimes you might need to look to your psychological health. And so I think that's a really important takeaway message. And then the second one is the message of don't give up. There are so many routes to poor mental health that I describe in my book, but there are also so many routes out. I love that message. There are so many routes out. Don't give up. We still have in our communities, unfortunately, stigmas, and especially people who live in small country towns where everybody knows everybody and there might be one doctor and some places don't even have, unfortunately, psychotherapists or psychologists. But for someone who's feeling ashamed of their mental illness or their diagnosis what words of wisdom through all of your experience and research and your book now could you say to that person who's listening in who maybe feels ashamed maybe not reaching out for the help Mm -hmm. and worried about what everyone else thinks i completely sympathize with that person and understand what they're going through, but they should know that they're not alone. Every single person in the world has either personally experienced a mental health condition or has a close friend or family member who has. That's how common it is. So while it might feel isolating, actually you're in the majority. You are part of our existence is facing mental health challenges, which sometimes become mental health illnesses. So you're not alone. Thank you for sharing that message. You're not alone. You were just so passionate about the brain. You're so curious and wanting to get to the bottom of all these questions that you ask. So I just really want to thank you for all of the work you do. You really just pour your heart and soul into it. And that came across in your book. I mean, the work you're doing is just so amazing. Thank you, Yvette. That's so kind. And I really, I hope people enjoy the book. How can we stay in touch with you after this podcast show? So feel free to get in touch with me via Twitter, at Camilla L. Nord. My email is also everywhere. So if you have a more detailed comment that you want to write to me, do feel free to get in touch. Thank you, Camilla. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And thank you for spending so much time with us today. It was a pleasure. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening into this podcast episode. I hope you found this conversation of interest and of benefit to you. In support, I would love for you to subscribe to Feel Good From Within with Yvette Lee Blowitz on any podcast app, YouTube or Rumble too. Be sure to share this show with your family, friends and community and to subscribe to my mailing list at yvetteleeblowitz.com or feelgoodfromwithin.com. And to follow Spirit Girl, Yvette Lee Blowitz, or Feel Good From Within on any social media app. And together, let's feel good from within.